1998 Godzilla is the first American Godzilla movie. It's what happens when you let America take control of Godzilla. There are some people that feel that this movie, even though it doesn't feel that much like a traditional Godzilla movie, is still a good monster movie. And there are some people that say it completely fails no matter how you look at it. But in general, people seem to think it's not a very good Godzilla movie. So the movie starts out with a bunch of shots of lizards out on islands in the South Pacific where atomic bomb tests are taking place. It's kind of funny the way they stare up into the distance as if they're mesmerized by everything that's happening when at the same time they're clearly not really reacting to something that's there. But that's the best part of the movie. That's the only part of the movie that feels like it's handling itself in a relatively serious way or that it has some kind of weight to what's happening. This movie screams mid to late 90s down to when they're showing locations and the text comes up and it's this internet <laughs> font that's glowing green and when it shows up it does all the bite beeping noises so it pays homage to its roots by having the first human shown on the screen a japanese man watching japanese tv eating japanese food on a japanese boat and then just like they would do with the property itself, they immediately have all the Japanese people get attacked and most of them die. So the only survivor of the fishing boat is this old man and he's in French Polynesia in some hospital and the French come, led by Jean Renault, to come talk to him to see what he saw. And I imagine this happened also the first time they screened this movie, the conversation they're having and the lines that they say. Il y a d'autres survivants. Non, monsieur, un seul. Because everyone died from watching it. And he says, what did you see? And he says, Godzilla. <laughs> so it's probably what happened the first time they screened the movie, too. After Godzilla attacks this boat and comes ashore on a few islands, the U.S. military calls in Dr. Nico Totopoulos, who is studying worms that have been mutated from the Chernobyl radiation disaster and have grown to a larger size. They decide to call him in because he's an expert on radiation and these footprints that this monster has left behind are radioactive. These footprints look completely different in different shots. They don't look like they're made by the same animal at all. They don't look like real footprints because footprints are not perfectly cookie cutter shapes that go into the ground and don't have any kind of distortion or deformities to them at all. Right away we get our first American characters and all the dialogue and character interactions are so 90s. People saying things that don't make sense, they make bad jokes at inappropriate times and their reactions are so cartoonish and over the top. The way the characters talk and the way their dialogue is written, this movie never lets you forget that you're watching a movie. You said our American characters, particularly the military people. Kevin Dunn, who is a typical yelling white American man. You know, whenever you see him in a movie, he's always angry or yelling at somebody. Yeah, well, this movie doesn't want to... You're not supposed to think at all about who these characters are. You should know exactly who they are as soon as you see them. Right. As soon as they open their mouth, a five-year-old is on board. They don't have to ask any questions. The military characters all have names like O'Neill... I mean, you've got Hicks from Aliens. I wonder if that was supposed to be an homage. If so, it's an insult. Agreed. We see Hicks as a yelling military guy. We see Matthew Broderick's character, smart but socially inept scientist. I find him a kind of a strange protagonist because he, he doesn't have any distinct qualities to his personality. He's not introverted, really, but he definitely seems a bit socially awkward, but it's not enough to make him stand out. He's the most generic protagonist in maybe any movie I've ever seen. Jean Reno as a French guy. His character is a French guy, and all the other characters refer to him as a French guy, or that French guy, because characters aren't really important in this movie. But stereotypes are. So when they bring Dr. Tatopoulos in, one of the other scientists there is a woman named Elsie. She is supposedly a paleontologist, and when they're looking at the footprints, she says, It's the rope of the Allosaurus. What? Some type of enormous reptile that we believe died out in the Cretaceous period. Which is not something that a scientist would ever say. First of all, anyone who would know what the word theropoda means would already know that Allosaurus is a theropod, so it wouldn't really make sense to say that. Calling it an Allosaurus is being very specific. That's a specific genus, a specific type of dinosaur. You can't tell what that is from those footprints. Allosaurus has never got that big. That doesn't make sense. And she also says they died out in the Cretaceous. They were already extinct by that point. What the hell kind of scientist, paleontologist is she? I assume all of the non-dinosaur buffs along with me are collectively rolling our eyes at that Allosaurus rant. Might as well have been a Brontosaurus. 
Even the old Godzilla movies, when they would pull in little science bits, a lot of times they didn't make any sense, including in the original Godzilla when they talk about dinosaurs. It doesn't excuse it because it's a fictional movie. The science in there should still be legit science, and that applies to the original Godzilla movies too. So that's not a complaint that is unique to this movie, but that doesn't excuse it either. I never hear you complaining about Harry Housen's use of dinosaurs. Harry Housen does a much better job, and the science in the Valley of Guanji is actually legit. In the same scene with the paleontologist, Dr. Tatopoulos, I'm going to call him Nick. Yeah. Nick says that the radiation has turned the creature into a hybrid. That doesn't make sense. A hybrid is a, is a mix between two animals that have been bred together. That's why it's a hybrid. Radiation on its own can't turn one animal into a hybrid. That doesn't make any sense. So the other scientist character, his gimmick is he just sneezes a lot. He doesn't even have any scientific revelations. He's just the guy on the side who sneezes. It seems like he's intended for comic relief, but every character in this movie makes bad jokes. It doesn't matter who the characters are, the, the jokes aren't funny and often don't make sense. So our team of scientists are the flunk-out paleontologist, the sneezing guy, and the main character who has no outstanding qualities. So the next character introduced is Audrey, played by somebody. Maria Patillo. Yeah. Who I've never seen in a movie outside of this. Um, I'm pretty sure this one destroyed her career. How would you describe her? Typical 90s, late 90s movie character where you, you kind of get insights into her personal life, which is full of little problems that don't really matter that much. It's like watching an episode of Friends. A character from Friends escaped into this movie. A lot of people find her annoying. A lot of people say she's one of the biggest problems with this movie. I wouldn't go that far. I think the movie has way bigger problems. She's a very generic character that even though she's trying to overcome her obstacles in her job to kind of achieve her goals, she never seems to be able to do anything because all she does is talk. She doesn't contribute anything to the movie. Harry Shearer, our first Simpsons actor, is the news anchor for the TV station. He plays Kent Brockman in Godzilla. His one-dimensional character is a sleazeball. Yeah, the stereotypical... Jerk boss. Who has no, no role or depth beyond that. He is a inconsequential foil to the inconsequential girlfriend. So it fits. <laughs> Jean Reno shows up. I don't know if you'd say he's the strongest character. I don't think there are any strongest characters, but at least he makes an impression. Yes, that's true. He probably acted like a normal person, and Roland Emmerich kept screaming at him to be more French. He probably <laughs> said, your character's supposed to be French. You have to be more French. God, it's like watching a white guy. You know, or something stupid like that. <laughs> <laughs> they probably told him. The same way that in foreign movies, they keep telling actors who are supposed to be American, they say, act more American. Be more American, and by the time it comes over and we see it... Yo, what's up? Uh, come on, put the gun down. No, no, see, too late for that. This here, get a hand cannon. I'll blow your ass all the way back to Jersey. Great! If any French person actually watched this movie, they would probably be insulted and think that's how Americans see French people. Because throughout the movie, he's looking for croissants, he's drinking French roast coffee, he talks with a French accent. <laughs> Every other character continually refers to him as that French guy. Who was that French guy anyway? Uh, just some insurance guy. No respect. No respect for Gene Reno. That's probably what they called him on set, too. <laughs> I said to Gene, Gene, get over here. Why doesn't he answer me? God, those French people. So watching Jean Reno talk to Kevin Dunn is like watching the most stereotypical French person talk to the most stereotypical American person who is even dressed in an American military uniform, who mispronounces his name. Speaking of mispronouncing people's names, the running joke, with quotation marks there, about Dr. Tatopoulos' last name and nobody being able to pronounce it, it's not funny the very first time it happens in the movie. So, of course, they say it maybe ten other times over the course of the movie, with different people pronouncing it different ways. It's not a hard name to pronounce once you've heard it, or even sounding it out. Even over a national newscast, they mispronounce it. It's a very 90s joke. The whole movie is just full of running jokes. They have all these scenes, and they're very formulaic of how the big reveal is laid out. So they have the one part where the boats get pulled under, 
And that's a whole scene. And later the military people are talking about it. The one guy says, Just got a report of three fishing trawlers going down. And Kevin Dunn says, Well, what makes you think it's related? The trawlers were pulled under, sir. They all look in the same direction and there's that big pause from everybody. And as an audience, we're supposed to open our eyes wider and gasp? I don't know. That kind of scene happens so many times in this movie. All of those scenes play out in a way where you already know what's going to happen almost as soon as the scene starts. My question is why their team of scientists are the three seemingly most inept scientists they could find. Wouldn't they have a whole building of scientists working on this? Especially if it's a not only a national security threat, but a worldwide security threat. Why do they have three scientists and one guy to yell at them? That's all they seem to have. And the guy in charge, Colonel Hicks doesn't seem to actually listen to what they're saying a lot of the time, or doesn't believe them, or doesn't go along with the information that they deliver to him. He'll make a dumb line like, Well, tell me what it is and tell me what the hell it is. So in typical this movie fashion, when they go to New York, instead of the location subtitle saying New York City, it says, and there's just a collective groan from me and you. <laughs> <laughs> so then we meet our second Simpsons character, Hank Azaria, who plays Mo Sislak in a yellow shirt. They talk about her relationship troubles. Oh yeah, she sees Nick on the TV, and who cares? We finally get our first real Godzilla scene, and it's a scene that was used in one of the trailers, where there's an old man going fishing on a pier when it's raining and cold, and these presumably homeless guys are kind of heckling him. The only thing you don't want to catch is a cold! <laughs> But of course, something starts tugging on his line. <laughs> I, I got a bite! And, you know, it's a 90s movie, so he's like, Why? <laughs> Do I have a bite? Nobody asks the question later why Godzilla would be tugging on that line. <laughs> but the line gets pulled out of his hands. Godzilla comes up and wrecks the dock. And again, a typical 90s action set piece running down the little dock there with all the boards flying up behind him and looking back every couple of seconds because you can't have somebody <laughs> run like they would in real life. They have to run like they would in a movie. I could walk faster than that. And the image of the big kind of swell of water coming toward him is a good image. It builds tension in a good way where you see it coming toward them. But just like every other character in this movie, they're just going to stand there and stare at it as it approaches instead of running away. Godzilla comes ashore. And is half hidden as he goes past a highway. But there's a big boat on his back. But there were clearly no boats there. He didn't run into any boats. Why would he have a big boat on his back? Where did it come from? I honestly didn't even think about that. I thought it was dumb that he keeps walking through the city and every few minutes it seems like another boat drops off. Okay, I'm going to double check and make sure there's no boats. Okay, there are some boats, but he goes in between them. He does not pick up the boats. I can confirm he did not pick up the boats. He's got four boats on his back and they're somehow balancing there. I will say... I do like the fact that you don't get a good look at Godzilla in this scene. It makes the scene more interesting and gives a little bit more attention to it because you don't know exactly what it looks like or what it is at this point. They're not putting all their cards on the table at once. I can't believe I'm saying this, but modern movies could learn from that a little bit. Wow. You know, if Roland Emmerich ever hears this, he's going to feel totally vindicated. Just like every other dumb character in this movie, there's a scene of a guy driving and he's staring up at Godzilla as he walks over. And instead of stopping or saying, I'm going to turn around, he just keeps driving. And then a boat falls in front of him and he crashes into the boat because he's an idiot. <laughs> just like every other character in this movie. Even they, when they get, they don't have any lines, they just have a few seconds of screen time. They are the dumbest characters. Like when Godzilla is stomping down the street and everyone's in a panic and he's dropping boats everywhere. There's one guy who's sitting in his truck with a newspaper in front of him and he's got little dinky headphones on and he's not paying attention to what's going on. Even though boats are falling out of the sky, cars are crashing, everything is shaking, there's fish flying everywhere, but he's reading his newspaper. He doesn't notice until Godzilla goes past his truck, digs his teeth into the truck and lifts the whole thing up. And when it's about 50 feet in the air, the guy finally goes, hey, what's going on? Well, I know for a fact that they didn't tell him they were shooting that scene and he was just looking at the newspaper just to pass the time and then they started shooting him with paintballs and that's where his surprise reaction comes from. Is that true? No, I made that whole thing up. Oh, dang. <laughs> <sighs> if you see it on IMDb, it's because I put it there and it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> 
And we do get in this scene the one shot in the movie that I actually kind of like, which is an overhead shot of Godzilla's foot with all the cars around him. It's very brief, and it doesn't make sense because people are stupid and just kind of not really trying to get away in a realistic way. But it's a cool looking shot with just his foot there in the middle of the street with the cars still crashing into his feet. And that's a practical foot because it's is not it? moving. I think it might be. And there's cars still driving and stuff. I'm going to say it's a practical effect. They probably had the car crash into something that was really there and inserted the foot, is what I would guess. Roland Emmerich also directed and co-wrote Independence Day, which came out in 1996. And Roger Ebert didn't like it. He said it was dumb. So as a barb to him, the mayor and the mayor's assistant in this movie is supposed to be a parody of Siskel and Ebert. But it's petty. It's stupid. It's not funny. I mean, it's not even really used for jokes. It's a, You're supposed to think it's funny just because it's there, which is true of a lot of the jokes in this movie. He does give his thumbs up when he's giving his speech. In case you're not sure, and subtlety is not your thing of putting a giant character yelling, I'm Ebert. Okay, you know what? Leonard Maltin gave the first Gremlins a bad review, so they actually put him in the second one. Really? Yes. And it's him talking about the first one. It's a very fourth wall thing. So he's talking about how dumb the first movie was, and then gremlins come and stab him to death on screen, (laughs) which is better than this. Okay, back to this movie. So as Godzilla continues his rampage, he walks past the news agency building where Harry Shearer is on the phone. And we get our third Simpsons character, Nancy Cartwright, who plays Bart. This one scene, I feel like, is a perfect encapsulation of this entire movie. Harry Shearer is on the phone talking about how he wants a good story and there's no good stories available. Godzilla walks right past without him noticing, somehow. Nancy Cartwright turns around and says, I think your story just walked by the window. And he turns and looks and doesn't notice. And he's like, what are you talking about? And the audience chuckles. At least that's what they're supposed to do. And it's so stupid and it makes me so mad. You forgot the other part. Because then he turns back around and starts talking on the phone. And then the tail comes up and zips by. And he misses that too. And we chuckle And he doesn't hear the loud sound that it makes as it whips by. This movie's so good. So of course Godzilla goes past the other major characters that are in New York. So Hank Azaria's character's name is Animal. I'm going to call him Animal from now on, as much as I think that's kind of stupid. He works for the news agency as a cameraman. He runs outside, grabs a movie camera to film Godzilla, and of course Godzilla gets away right before he can figure out how to work it, even though that's his job. And we get a shot of some fire hydrants spraying water in the air, and as soon as he starts running after Godzilla, one of them disappears in the next shot, because they're all digital and they forgot to reinsert it into that shot. So, of course, in typical 90s movies fashion, Animal goes running across the roofs of cars while this supposedly heroic music plays that sounds really stupid and on the nose like every other musical cue in this movie. And, of course, even as Godzilla's walking right toward him and you should be, you know, tense and wondering about what's going to happen, there's a joke about him finally getting the tape into the camera and it's all played for laughs. And even his reaction as Godzilla's about to step on him, he has the stupidest, goofiest, over-the-top, ridiculous expression on his face. And then Godzilla seemingly steps on him, but he didn't really. He's in between two of his toes. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) You're making me angry even the way you're saying that. (laughs) And of course, the camera he's using is a Sony camera. Well, they were all driving Lexus cars before, too. So then Animal can't believe he's alive after that encounter. And has a good 10 second dumb laugh scene where he's just laughing at his good fortune and it makes me want to hurt him. <laughs> so then we introduce our other military character, stereotypically named O'Neill, who for some reason is in charge of quite a few troops but can't form a coherent sentence without stuttering and blubbering all over himself. Uh, after its initial at- attack, he uh, disappeared. Roland Emmerich seems to think that precipitation adds intensity and action to a scene. It's raining probably 80% of this movie. This is not a movie that does a good job of creating atmosphere of any kind, and the rain doesn't help anything. It's just kind of there, just like everything else in this movie. So Godzilla disappears. O'Neill says they don't know where he went. No, he asks him where he went, and he goes, We don't, we don't, um, we, we, we don't know. (laughs) What the hell do they mean it disappeared? Okay, I get it went out of the main character's line of sight, 
But that doesn't mean there's not other people in New York City when it turned the corner. Yeah, well, the paleontologist says that he probably went back to the river, but Nick says no. This is a place where he can easily hide. He's in there someplace. The most densely populated area in the country is a place where a gigantic lizard can easily hide. That can't walk without shaking every building and setting off every car alarm in a six block radius. That can't turn a corner without knocking a building down. That can't do anything without making a ton of noise and causing a ton of damage and making a bunch of CGI fire hydrants spew up into the air. I also like how when Godzilla is not affecting the main characters themselves, everyone acts like, not just the main characters, everyone acts like everything is okay. We can all go back to our lives until Godzilla starts affecting the main characters again. So Nick convinces the authorities to evacuate Manhattan, and they say they have to check every building because they have good reason to believe that he may be hiding inside one of them. Yeah. How, how does Godzilla get into a building without you being able to tell that he got into that building? He snuck in the service entrance. Yeah, I always question that too. It doesn't make any sense. God, every scene, it's raining. Is that supposed to be a running joke too? Like it always rains in New York? I'm trying to remember. They said something about how it makes everything feel more mysterious or something like that when you're making a generic, comedic, dumb action movie if, if you could call it that it makes everything feel wet you know it's wet the plot of this movie so in the aftermath of godzilla's rampage we see a building that he did walk through and it's just like a big hole in the building but it's somehow still intact and supporting itself maybe that's the building he's hiding in john renault introduces himself as a representative of an insurance company that is responsible for many of the buildings in new york but really we can tell by his shifty eyes and the way he plants a bug the size of a cantaloupe on the back of the mayor's <laughs> collar that he might not be working for an insurance company. The bug placement is incredibly obvious. It's not even under his collar. And the fact that the mayor is going into all these military meetings, the first thing they would do is just give him a quick check. I would think these are national security meetings. After Jean Renault plants the bug and he's walking away, he lets go of his umbrella as everybody's walking past and it just kind of gets carried away. Yeah, I thought that was funny. Why does he do that? Because it's funny. Is it? No. <laughs> is it supposed to be funny? No, it's not. I don't know why he does it. I think it's supposed to look cool and Yeah, mysterious. it's supposed to look cool, but... It makes him look like an idiot because now he's going to walk away in the rain. Yeah. Or if anything, it would draw more attention to himself. Yeah, people would say like, hey, uh, you dropped your umbrella on purpose because I saw you do it. Why did you do that? Jean Reno is really a part of the French Secret Service, and they're operating out of a hotel room and a UPS fan. So we get our first French-American clash when one of the French agents brings back a bunch of donuts. And Jean Reno picks out a donut and looks at it, and he goes, No croissant? No, monsieur. <sighs> it's a f***ing pastry. Eat it. I know I sound like a conservative, but it's a donut. <laughs> and he looks at the donut way too long. He looks at... It's a donut. <laughs> I don't get too mad about certain stuff, but I get mad about that donut. And then he takes a drink of the coffee and he makes a face and he goes, Oh, you call this coffee? And the guy goes, I call this America. But I could easily see them replacing the word coffee with movie. Oh, you call this movie? And I call this America. Hmm. They're listening to the mayor in the military meeting. And again, it shows that behemoth bug on the back of his collar. I'm surprised it didn't bother him and he's not scratching it half the time. It's huge. And there are people, military people, all around him. And they say, what's that? And what, he's pissed because they're going to evacuate the city. And the military says, and yeah. it's an election year. Yeah. They make jokes about that because you know that that's what they're going to do. So then they go down into the subway and they realize he's been digging in the subways, which nobody figured that out earlier. Nobody would have said, I'm going to get on the subway and then got down there and it was missing. Or there was a giant hole. Because last I checked, a couple people take the subway in New York City now and then. Nick has proven right for the first time. And we'll see that even though he doesn't have any particular reasons to have better insight than other people in a lot of these situations, everything that he predicts happens, everything that he says about Godzilla and about the plot is exactly what he says it's going to be. And he usually starts those phrases with, well, I don't think so. And then he'll I mean, spew it. out a bunch it's of sharp. exposition that turns out to be true Violet. later. And down in the subway, we see some fish flopping around. Why are they still alive? So then they do a whole montage scene to trap Godzilla. They bring in literal tons of fish and dump them all into Central Park to lure him there. The music is very simplistic, which fits with the rest of the movie. 
Command, they have just entered the city. You could walk into any scene of this movie at any point, having never seen the movie before, and know exactly what's happening and how you're supposed to feel about it. So the military has all their tanks and their guns pointed at the fish, and you have O'Neill kind of sputtering his way through, giving orders. What about the color palette of this movie? It's very bland. The way this movie is shot, nothing stands out visually. Every single shot is just there to serve its purpose in the narrative, with seemingly no real thought put to it beyond that. The French guy somehow gets in with the army. All he had to do was wear a camo raincoat. And when he talks, he's only speaking in French, I'm pretty sure. You know, he's got his little sneak walkie-talkie, and he's going, omelette du fromage, you know, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who snuck in, his name is Jean-Luc, which I think is awesome. The coffee, he says, I thought you said this was French roast. And then the guy sticks it out of the doorway, and it says French roast on it. So it's our second funny French food joke. How many other French foods are they going to have? I'm surprised they don't have one and say... You couldn't find any escargot or some stupid shit like that. French fries. And then he gets McDonald's and he's like, oh, you call these French fries. But they don't have. <laughs> yeah, they could have made a whole bunch of French wordplay things. When they capture Godzilla, he could say, we got this one in the baguette. <laughs> when they're uh, running from Godzilla and he's chasing them, he could look out the back window and be like, crap, he's right behind us. <laughs> Come on, we got to escargo! All right, well, let's let's move on with the plot. So Nick gets a disposable camera, which I'm surprised the military would allow him to just take pictures of everything. Yeah, what is he taking those pictures for? When they specifically get mad at him later for giving pictures away. They dump a bunch of fish out in Central Park, and Nick says they need to go pull up all the manhole covers so that the smell will get down into the sewers down underground where Godzilla is. Which, by the way, if he's burrowing underground in the subways and stuff, how much is he going to be, you know, upsetting the Structural stability integrity. of the entire area? Yeah. So, again, Nick is some random guy who knows a little bit about radiation. He doesn't know specifically about Godzilla, but... It's very generic of saying, you're a scientist, so you must know everything about all the sciences. Anything involving intelligence, he has to be the one to make that revelation it would be like if you were stranded on an island with a paleontologist you got horrifically hurt and you said oh i need you to you know reset my arm and they'd be like i don't know how to do that and be like you're a doctor damn it jim i'm a paleontologist not a medical doctor <laughs> so when the soldiers are pulling up the manhole covers nick sees one that's a little distance away and says give me one of those pry bars and he goes over to pull it up by himself and the way the entire scene is set up you already know you know something's going to happen there he's not just going to pull open a manhole cover like everybody else is doing you know it's going to be the manhole cover that's going to set something off so when nick pulls open the manhole cover the weird cgi crack just kind of generates in the ground without the ground actually splitting apart at all it's just like a crack that appears godzilla spits up a bunch of crap and yet again a character that should run away stands there looking down then godzilla pops out and he runs a little bit but then he gets stopped by a piece of pavement that lands in front of him and instead of running away he kind of stands there and watches again but every time a character is running away it's 1998 they could have done it a little bit better you know it looks like they are very much not part of that scene clearly composited in. So this is the first time we see all of Godzilla very clearly. The first thing I notice, I mean, it's the thing that you haven't seen up to this point is his face, and his face is the most distinct part of him. It's very underwhelming. He has kind of a big fat snout and a really large lower jaw for some reason that is more distracting than anything. And of course, the CGI is not that great, but the design feels very bland. I was going to say it feels very 90s extreme of what would look cool. We want him to look sleek. We want him to look badass. We want him to look extreme with an X. I would definitely say that in terms of the overall body profile, yeah. In terms of him being slimmer, even the way the spikes on his back kind of jut forward. Yeah, they look like a toy action figure spikes from McFarlane. And then Godzilla and Nick have a moment where he doesn't just eat him or step on him or treat him with total indifference because why would he care but because he's a main character he gets down really close to him and they're looking eye to eye and at this point you say why the hell is this happening and why the hell am i watching this movie and then <laughs> and then the military guys say this would be our chance to fire but they 
don't. For some reason, Godzilla opens his mouth and roars right into his face. And because it's a movie, we're supposed to chuckle. But in real life, it would have blown his eardrums without a doubt. You can physically see the air rush by. And all Nick can do is make a face because his breath smells so bad. (laughs) So Godzilla heads down toward the fish and the soldiers are holding their fire for the moment. And the music is majestic Godzilla music. supposed to be in awe of his size and his strength and his grace and his coolness so he starts eating the cgi fish and the way that pile kind of falls i'm not a big fan of that it just looks like multiple layers superimposed on each other kind of sliding past each other looks like a cartoon mouse eating some cheese and every time he takes a bite a big chunk of cheese just vanishes the army is presumably about to attack and nick still runs out with his camera and is just sitting there taking pictures They finally get the order to fire. Godzilla's not moving. He's sitting there eating fish. Every single person that fires a shot completely misses. And you can see the tracer fire from some of these machine guns when Godzilla kind of ducks out of the way of shots that are mostly going to miss anyway. They don't adjust their fire. They keep firing at these buildings in the distance. It reminds me of Conga when those guys are shooting all over the place at the end. And it seems a bit strange that the American military is portrayed as being so completely inept throughout the entire movie like that when this is not the japanese making a godzilla movie with the american military it's the americans making a movie with the american military godzilla starts running away and a couple of humvees chase after him firing machine guns at him at one point godzilla turns around does he breathe the fire i never understood that there are some vehicles on fire and it seems like his breath ignites and turns into a big fireball that consumes the humvees and the reason that scene is in there is because People complained early on that Godzilla, they found out that Godzilla wasn't going to have any kind of heat beam or radiation beam in this movie. He said he needs to have some kind of weapon that comes out of his mouth. And they kind of tried to compromise by having something weird like this happen. Which is confusing. Yeah, it's a bit unclear as to why that happens and what exactly happens and whether Godzilla knew that was going to happen the way he lowers his head down before he does it. Three helicopters are chasing Godzilla and then we get one of the quote-unquote iconic scenes where they shoot at Godzilla while he's standing on top of a building and he ducks out of the way and the missiles hit the Chrysler building instead and the top of the Chrysler building falls and smashes onto the ground and Roland Emmerich climaxed at this point all over the place and the special effects budget just went through the roof. And these are helicopters that could just fly over the buildings instead of flying between them all the time. That doesn't give me any tension. I have to wonder why they're so stupid. We even see them do it while the Chrysler building is falling apart. When they fire the missiles at Godzilla, they say that they're locked on, but then they don't actually lock on, and they say it's because he's colder than the buildings around him, which doesn't make sense because Godzilla's a large animal. He's going to be, whether he's cold-blooded or warm-blooded, he's going to have a lot of heat in his body especially given how big he is. He's going to be warmer than those buildings. Two guys are looting a store, and they're showing a movie in black and white on the TV. What's the movie? The movie is It Came From Beneath the Sea, which is Ray Harryhausen's third movie. So the choppers are still chasing him, zigzagging through buildings for some reason. They fire their machine guns nonstop, even when Godzilla's not there, and they're firing into buildings all over the place. And there's, again, helicopters right behind other helicopters. They're all just firing past each other. And you know there are still people in the city. Even now, when we have hurricane warnings, people say they can't make me leave and they stay. Well, we do see a lot of lights on still in a lot of these windows. If they supposedly evacuated as well as they could, it seems like there's still a lot of people in there. Then they get to a big hole and they all form up and they shoot a bunch into the hole, even though they can't see anything. And then they say... I think we got him. And then he busts out of the building behind them in typical this movie fashion and just starts (laughs) swatting them down. Yeah, I have multiple questions about that. Why did they start firing if they didn't see anything? Why did they assume they got him? They could hear him roaring even. How could they not tell that those roars were not coming from in front of them? How did Godzilla get behind them if he just went through that building? Can he teleport now? Did he burrow through the ground and come up somewhere else? No, he went through the surface entrance, just like before. And he's chasing this final helicopter. Why doesn't the helicopter... Just go up. Yeah. And then, of course... I think I lost him. And then he gets eaten from below. Godzilla snuck past him. And, of course, 
it's the 90s, so the very last shot is the propeller zooming up towards the camera as the chopper explodes. And then there's that iconic scene of Godzilla having sex with the, the building. building. Yeah. While <laughs> lightning flashes all over the place. Yeah. They wounded Godzilla with some of the bullets, so Nick is shown picking up some blood. It was probably from when he scraped on a building. Yeah. As opposed to them actually hitting him. Good point. So he takes it to a drugstore because, again, only he can figure things out. There's no indication of why he would take it to a drugstore, but he gets a bunch of pregnancy tests because he has a hunch that Godzilla is pregnant, even though there's been no indication of anything like that. Yeah, why does he do that? And why doesn't he go to the authorities and say, hey, I got some samples, let's go analyze them or whatever? Right. Even when he finds out that he was right and Godzilla is pregnant, then he starts to link the clues from before. But it would logically make sense to say those clues first and say, that's why I'm doing this. That was asking too much of the screenwriters, apparently. Um, I would also like to point out that his girlfriend's shirt is the carpet from The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this movie has deeper layers than we were aware of? Well, we haven't talked about his girlfriend in a little bit. She's dumb. Done. Well, she stole her boss's badge by accident, but then decided to go ahead and use it to pretend she's a reporter and get some inside scoop because she and Nick used to date. Nobody watching this movie cares, but the movie pretends that it has some kind of emotional depth to it. But I don't have to be a news agency to tell you that it doesn't. She asks him if he's still mad that when he asked her to marry him, she just walked out and completely disappeared appeared and he says yeah i'm kind of still mad and she turns to him as if it's his fault and says that was eight years ago some people change as if it makes it all okay or he should just forgive her and assume everything's okay when she's the one that just popped in out of nowhere and the first thing she says is are you still mad after disappearing at that point in their relationship so i just wanted to point that out and how does that make you feel <laughs> <laughs> What are you really trying to say? So Nick finds out that Godzilla is pregnant. By using human pregnancy tests on a mutated reptile. And he has this whole lab set up. And apparently he's the only one using it. And they still have these searchlights going on all outside. And where is Godzilla at this point? After he blew up the chopper, they just cut away. Instead of sending more vehicles out after him, there's military all over the city. They just don't worry about it anymore. Because again, he's not affecting the main characters. So it's cool. Of course, you get one of those bad... 90s sex jokes when Nick says that Godzilla reproduces asexually. Where's the fun in that? That's what I asked about this movie. Because, you know, <laughs> the back of this DVD that I was forced to pay $3 for says, quote, It's big. It's loud. It's fun. But it's not. His girlfriend steals the top secret military tape to forward her news career because that's a subplot we all have really cared about up to this point. Then they decide to look for Godzilla and they're going through the subway and then we get one of the worst parts of this whole thing where two military guys find a tunnel and it's blocked at the end and they say there's nothing here let's go and then when they turn around it turns out it was Godzilla's head and they're right at his eye and his eye opens up right behind them and makes all this noise and then he disappears <sighs> I hate this movie so then Nick reveals to the military that he believes Godzilla is pregnant. And then he links all his clues together. And then the French guys also mess up his name because it's a joke in all languages. And then his girlfriend realizes that Harry Shearer stole her report. The only clever thing about any of this is the name of the report is The Origin of the Species. I bet somebody intelligent snuck on set and kind of jotted that in and nobody caught it or else they would have gotten rid of that. And then we get Chris Ellis, who is your go-to military guy. He's a military guy in Transformers, NCIS, Helter Skelter, JAG, Planet of the Apes, the 2001 one. So he, you know, gives his best lines. You, you went, went to, to the, the press, press with this? this? No. no. No, I didn't talk to anybody. anybody. They, they mentioned you by name. name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this movie's awesome. So then they fire him. So now they only have two scientists working on this whole project. A guy who sneezes and a lady who still thinks Godzilla is a dinosaur. Nick confronts his girlfriend 
and walks away and then animal decides to follow him because he's a main character then the cab driver is the french guy and he wants nick to start working with them to go find the nest and the military is elected not to go look for the nest even though nick has been right with every single one of his hunches about every single thing that's happened in the movie so far and they have no reason not to go look for a nest right it seems like the possibility of a nest is something that you wouldn't want to just ignore regardless of you know whether you trust this guy at this point or not and then when they get to the french base of operations there's all this weaponry how did you get all this stuff into the country this is america you can't buy anything ah it's funny so then animal follows nick and finds all the french people so he goes back to nick's girlfriend and for some reason we have to keep these characters in the movie i don't understand why it doesn't give anything to the movie animal and his girlfriend and everyone else yeah agreed even the military at this point they don't matter nobody else matters so they decide to go in to the city after them to prove nick right because that will make everything better between him and his girlfriend when they get to the city limits to get in they have to go through a military blockade so they dress up in army uniforms and jean renault gives them all sticks of gum because that makes them look more american and he puts on a faux elvis accent well no sir i'm fine because that's the only way he can pull off an american accent that's why in the movie i assume i mean it's so stupid i'll thank you very much so they all go into the subway system when they encounter godzilla down there he shows himself by popping his head out through a tunnel wall and apparently that's how he digs is by just shoving his face into things that's not a very practical or realistic way for an animal to dig especially when he's got those arms but his arms don't really reach in front of his head that well plus he's got those spikes that would keep getting caught on things as he's trying to crawl through the freaking tunnels it just doesn't make sense he's not an animal made for burrowing based on his design so the military is trying to to kill Godzilla again so they try and do the same plan again because it went so well the first time so they put down a bunch of fish but even Godzilla is smarter than these characters and he's a dumb animal O'Neill says damn it fire before it's clear what he's going to do. As the audience, you know what's going to happen already, but in the scene itself, there's no specific indication that he's turning away yet. And then they all start shooting at him again. And then once he starts running, they start chasing him. But instead of three helicopters, now we have 30 helicopters. Because it makes more sense to have more obstacles to dodge while you're going around between buildings and trying to shoot not the people in front of you, but a big animal that somehow you can't hit. And again, zooming through the building zigzag, why don't they have people shooting from the tops of the tall buildings down? Why don't they put up things on the ground so when he steps on it, it would hurt? You know, big spikes or something. Maybe mines. Not like they're going to cause more damage than he's already caused. So then he jumps into the river. In a weird scene that he makes a really small splash when he jumps in. He doesn't really displace a lot of water. He's a good diver. And then the doctor from Jason Goes to Hell says, Don't worry, the Navy has a little something they're waiting for. And then he eats Jason's heart. Godzilla outsmarts them again because every person in this movie is an idiot. You know what's going to happen as soon as the scene starts because it's already happened and if this movie knows one thing better than anything else it's formula even though that formula is crappy and broken so then they hit godzilla and he's supposedly dead and they're all going yeah we did it cool problem solved so they go to madison square garden that's where the nest is and again those fish flopping around and who knows how long they've been sitting i mean it bugs me because they had to make those fake fish to flop around and stuff wasted effort for something that doesn't make sense so they find the nest and of course nick at first he says three eggs i thought there'd be more and then somebody points out that there's more and you see in the subsequent shots that they were there the whole time but somehow he didn't see them and all these eggs are somehow standing perfectly straight up and they are all over the place in a way where there's no way Godzilla could lay those eggs like that without just crushing a bunch of eggs as it moved around and while they're down looking at the eggs Nick still has his stupid camera that he keeps taking pictures for no reason i don't know what the hell he's doing that for thankfully they have a lot of practical eggs and not all a bunch of cartoon cgi eggs that would be even better so then he gets really close to an egg and he puts his ear against it which is gross he puts his hand on it <laughs> 
he can feel something moving in it. And then, as typical for this movie, all the eggs start hatching all at the same time. And everybody just stands around staring at them for so long. Even when that first one, when its head pops out. And they do the thing where Jean Reno and Matthew Broderick look at each other and then turn around to the sounds behind them, which we already know what it all is. Yeah, all the eggs start We know everything rattling. that's going to happen. We don't even need to finish watching the movie. I think you could say that after the first five minutes. And again, thankfully, a lot of these, when they hatch, are practical creatures. Which is totally ruined five minutes later when they're all jumping around in the hallways. As soon as that first egg cracked, they would be booking it out of there. No, but they gotta make jokes. Like, don't you think we have enough already? I just won't. <laughs> yeah, that's good for me. That's plenty. So we don't really see them all eating all of the fish, but after about 30 seconds, Nick goes, You smell like the fish. It doesn't matter. You're a small meat animal, and they're dinosaurs. They're going to eat you. The whole scene where they're running away from them is like a freaking amusement park ride where it's not actually supposed to be scary. It's supposed to be sort of exciting and fun, and it feels like that's what it's supposed to be for the actors. It doesn't. It never feels like there's any real tension or any real danger there. So they split off into groups and of course the expendable characters end up getting killed almost immediately even though the main characters have no trouble evading tons and tons of creatures that are right in front of them okay so the first little group that gets killed are two of the expendable french guys and the one guy looks up and they're all above him and he smells his hand and then he realizes he smells like fish it doesn't matter that you smell like a fish they're going to attack you because they're hungry and then the other guy, for some reason, closes the door, but then opens the door and peeks through it again, and then they all bust through the door and eat him. I think it's supposed to be them pushing it open, but it doesn't make sense either way. He's still standing there. If he was trying to yeah. get out of there, then he would be in the process of... He's just standing there. If he was trying to get out of there, he'd be in the wrong movie. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. When you see the little Godzilla's running over the tile, it looks particularly bad because their reflections and shadows don't really match anything. It doesn't look like they're really there at all. And the lighting conditions down in these tunnels don't seem to be helping much either. And then the acting from everybody running away from them is the most movie acting that we've gotten in this movie so far. Everybody stops to look back every half second. Nobody seems to actually be worried about anything. People hesitate all the time. And there's Nick making stupid jokes when he's in the elevator wrong floor why are all the lights flickering down there in all the hallways and when they show one practical head once in a while it really accentuates how bad the cgi is when it cuts back to them all pinballing around. So then Audrey and Animal manage to get in contact with Nick and the French guy. They do a typical movie thing where Animal tries to unlock the door and Jean Rigo says, let me try, and then he shoots the lock. When they're in the video feed room, there's an alien from Independence Day on the monitor. Putting it right in front of the camera whenever they cut to Audrey, it's a little too much. They manage to contact a video technician who can relay their signal to the public so everyone knows what's going on, and they have to take care of the creatures. Audrey is talking on camera, and in order to convince the technician about what's going on, they pan over to all the creatures outside, and all of a sudden, as soon as they pan over, you can hear all the noises that the creatures are making, even though the camera's there in the same place. So the feed goes live, so everyone's looking at it, and they decide to blow up Madison Square Garden. And just in case you're not paying attention, or you're five, the military guy literally says, Let me spell it out for you. I want you to blow up Madison Square Garden. So, you know, a couple people in the theater probably went, Oh, okay. This movie's <laughs> really confusing. And then the baby Godzilla's finally managed to get into the little room that they're in, and Jean Reno does his action movie stuff by shooting out the windows, dropping a line down, and, like, rappelling down. You forgot to say he says a one-liner, too. Party's over. Time to leave. When he throws the cable out the window, it makes the most over-exaggerated sound effect. And it doesn't even match what the object is actually doing. When they're running away from the little Godzillas, Nick knocks over everything that they're running past to drop some balls and some gumballs for them to trip over. And it's a cartoonish, stupid scene. And of course, he stops to stare at them for 25 seconds before deciding to go on. So they send these jets to blow up Madison Square Garden. Where were these jets before? If the helicopters didn't work the first time to kill Godzilla... Why don't you send us something better? Send in the jets. If that doesn't work, then just nuke New York. <laughs> 
Yeah, the logical approach. When they show all of the little Godzillas all together, it's an egregious CGI shot because the lighting on them is all different, even though they're all standing right next to each other. I can do that with Photoshop, and I don't even know how to use Photoshop. It's just putting layers in front of layers without thinking about anything. I do like the chandeliers that he shoots. And the creature's just, you know, jumping out of the way, and then even after they fall, still not trying to attack them or anything. They fire these heavily explosive missiles into Madison Square Garden. And of course, it's the movie thing where they're running away, and this massive explosion just knocks them down. Whereas in real life, they would be thrown forward and be deaf if they didn't die first from the force or the yeah, heat. not to mention all the shrapnel that'd be flying out. Or the fact they've been in this movie for almost two hours. At least it's a practical effect when the building explodes, at least for most of the shots. So then even though cars are flipped upside down and there's rubble everywhere, they're just lying face down and they get up. And start making dumb jokes. Right. They start making dumb jokes immediately. Then they make out Animal and Jean Reno. <laughs> <laughs> But then plot twist, there's still a freaking half hour left of this movie because Godzilla is not dead. And he somehow managed to get back up, burrow under the entire city apparently, come straight up through the blown up Madison Square Garden. Conveniently at the same time that all this is happening. No one on the military side has said anything like Godzilla's body is gone. It's right on the side of the island you know where it was because you have sonar and you shot it go get it and i only know this because i read it somewhere but it's the hudson river i think that godzilla jumps into and apparently it's it's never more than like 200 feet deep but in this movie it looks like it goes down forever but that's i mean i don't care so if they had shot those missiles a minute later they could have killed godzilla at the same time oh, he would have dodged those missiles he would have done a somersault and flipped over the half the island and jumped into the ocean again is this episode two godzilla had no trouble catching some helicopters earlier but when he's chasing a few people on foot it's the most difficult thing he's done in this movie so far and they managed to get into a taxi and now godzilla's running at the speed of a taxi and he still can't catch them and they drive over his foot in a great action set piece yeah so godzilla is chasing one little taxi and he can't get it because Jean Reno is such a good driver. Hey man, he's driven through the vineyards of France. He knows what he's doing. He's a professional. This taxi has done more damage to Godzilla than anything else in the movie because he keeps tripping and falling over when he's chasing after it. Because even though he's he can take sharp turns that helicopters can barely follow after, this one taxi is just too much for him. And our Jurassic Park homage continues. <laughs> It appears a card explodes while it's in the air or something. I'm not too sure. Uh, it reminds me of the bad CGI in Godzilla Final Wars. So they end up driving into a tunnel and it's a dead end and Godzilla's blocking the exit. And of course Nick again is the one who comes up with the solution. This thing have high beams? Such a great one-liner. And then Jean Reno completes it by just looking at him and giving him that smile. But Nick still has to be the one to tell him exactly when to turn the beams on. He's got to have that action hero moment. Right. By this point, the military knows that Godzilla's around again. And Nick has let them know that he's going to try to lure Godzilla to the Brooklyn Bridge so that he'll be trapped in the cables. So they tell the jets to turn back around. Meanwhile, they somehow manage to drive into Godzilla's mouth. And in case you're not sure what's happening, Animal keeps shouting, We're in his mouth! We're in his mouth! And of course, Nick, again, he's got to pull out his hero moment and shove an electrical cable that's hanging from something. I don't even know where that cable's coming from. And somehow it's got electricity running through it still. He shoves it right next to his tooth. And they manage to survive driving out of his mouth onto what's left of the bridge in a great CGI moment. So Godzilla becomes trapped in the cables on the bridge. The jets fly by, shoot some missiles at him. You can tell I'm excited because this scene is awesome. The army guys, he says, target is still standing. And he goes, well, circle around and fire again! Every line of dialogue, I'm sure Roland Emmerich said, you have to act like you're more angry just all the time. Every line, there's going to be a scene where you're at your daughter's ballet and you have to stand up at the end and say so angrily, that was good. God! Just act pissed about everything. I could have written this movie back in 1998. And then Nick, when Godzilla falls, they have another moment. Uh, the true emotional core of this movie. And you can hear the heartbeat slowing, slowing. And then I died from watching this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
And this is the only scene in the movie where it seems we're supposed to have some kind of sympathy for Godzilla, but we don't because he's been a mindless animal the whole time with no personality whatsoever. And he's killed a lot of people, destroyed a lot of things because, again, he's a mindless animal. He invaded something that was already there. It's not as if humans invaded his habitat and he was just defending himself. It's not King Kong. No. I remember in the theater, there was a little girl and at this part, she went, Did Godzilla die and i turned around and i said yes shut up <sighs> yeah and then i went back to sleep so then everyone's happy that godzilla is dead and we get some more bad jokes hicks congratulates o'neill and says that's one hell of a job soldier and then of course it's a 90s movie so he repeats it that's one hell of a job he didn't do anything good job for doing what as if o'neill has redeemed himself somehow when he's proven nothing but incompetent the entire movie he's a bumbling oaf the entire time we get the splitting of siskel and ebert everything has to be wrapped up and tied nice and neat with a bow because that's what kind of movie this is so we have to see where every character ends up how their subplot gets resolved even though we don't care about any of them it's still raining audrey quits her job john renault takes animals tape and he says he'll give it back later after he puts in some footage of Leon the Professional. And then since it's the 90s, it shows Jean Reno strolling down an alley by himself in the rain. He's got a long walk. Do you know how far it is to their base? It's going to take him a week. He'll take the subway. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about how long it would take him to actually get back. No, well, we've seen him. Uh, he hijacked that taxi by just shoving a knife into the, the ignition. He'll just do the same thing to another car, or maybe a tank. Our last scene, because it's 1998, people, all right? So we have to have some dumb, it's not over yet, type scene at the end. So it cuts back to Madison Square Garden, and there's one egg left, which in reality, there'd probably be a bunch of eggs left. You would expect the military to go in and do a th more thorough investigation, but based on the characters in this movie, maybe you wouldn't. So our last scene is one egg hatching, and a Godzilla head comes out, and it plays triumphant music. Why does it play triumphant music? I don't know. And why does it cut to this weird song in the credits? Oh, I forgot. It's from 1998. Yeah. Oh, and the French people's names? They all are Jean. Jean-Luc, Jean-Claude, Jean-Pierre, and Jean-Philippe. Really? If we couldn't get more stereotypical French, Frank Welker did creature vocals because of course he did frank welker is awesome and that's godzilla 1998 america's way of showing up japan and showing them how it's really done we both saw this movie back when it came out and i think it's safe to say we're both godzilla fans i love godzilla more than any other franchise in existence i'm trying to approach this movie just purely as its own movie as its own thing independent from the other godzilla movies so we were probably about 10 when this movie came out I grew up watching this movie a lot as a kid. It was one of the only movies we had. But at the same time, my dad, Saturday mornings, we would always watch the reruns of the Japanese Godzilla movies. So when I heard they were making a new one, I just assumed it would be like the ones I had grown up watching. But it turned out to be this instead, which is a whole different thing. Yeah, I was extremely excited when this movie was about to come out. They didn't show Godzilla in the marketing stuff initially. Which is smart. I still remember when they when I first saw what this Godzilla was going to look like. It was on the news and they just had a still image up in the corner and it was small and I couldn't really tell what I was looking at, but I could tell it didn't look like Godzilla. And I was really confused. We finally saw the movie in the theater and even back then I was extremely disappointed. And that's why you saw it twice. I saw it twice because I didn't have a, a, I was a kid. I didn't have a choice the second time. My family was going to see it again. I didn't, I specifically said, I do not want to see this movie. Let's go see anything else. And we went to see it again. My questions are, Godzilla, where did he come from? Why is he here? Sorry, that's what Hero Shearer says at that one part. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sad to say I've watched this movie my fair share of times. I can quote it inside and out, and I do it often in real life. That's embarrassing. Agreed. I didn't say it wasn't. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, we'll be sitting in a restaurant, we'll be ready to go, and I'll just go, we're leaving. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's okay. Yeah. We make popcorn movies. We love popcorn movies. When you have that kind of passion for the films you make, there's a chance that that passion may become infectious 
Every single decision that was made during the making of this movie was a poor decision, starting with ignoring everything about Godzilla and just making a movie called Godzilla that barely resembles a Godzilla movie at all. Of course, this Godzilla doesn't look anything like the real Godzilla, the normal Godzilla. Roland Emmerich said that he wanted a Godzilla that would be fast, that he wanted that to be the defining attribute of the monster. Because, of course, that's what you think of when you have a huge building-sized monster that it's racing around, zipping past helicopters and cars. Only now can we really present Godzilla in the way that I think the original authors intended him to be. There's nothing interesting about Godzilla as a monster in this movie. It's almost like he's just a vague plot element. But you could say that about every single character in this movie, too. They could have titled the movie after any of the characters. Audrey. Animal. <laughs> French guy. Is there something that you like about this movie? Any kind of detail or... Anything I like? I like that one shot of Godzilla's foot from above. Um... I like that they don't show Godzilla that well until a decent way into the movie. Although once they do show him, it just makes it that much more disappointing. Mm. I like that the opening implies that you're going to get a movie with maybe some kind of... I like the opening. Some kind of deeper themes to it. But the fact that Godzilla was created by nuclear weapons doesn't ever come up again in the movie, other than the fact that the French are trying to cover up their part in it. Nobody ever brings up the fact that Godzilla is radioactive, that the guy who survived the boat attack at the beginning was radioactive. It never comes up again how many people are going to die from radiation poisoning in new york because nobody thought about that later on in the movie even nick who's an expert supposedly on radiation i wanted to mention the french are the ones responsible for the nuclear testing that creates godzilla is that because they were afraid of making the americans responsible it seems a little bit strange it doesn't have anything to do with godzilla traditionally and it seems like an extraneous element in this movie and to be clear to people out there who think we don't like this movie because it's not a good godzilla movie i don't think any of the points that we've made so far other than some of the ones on godzilla's design have to do with the fact that it's not a godzilla movie it's just a bad movie and even if it wasn't a godzilla movie and it was called something else his design is still not interesting it's i would go so far as to say it's ugly especially his face and it doesn't fit with the way he acts in the movie with the way he's burrowing around and everything and he's got no no unique attributes to make him stand out as a unique monster the movie is consistent on all fronts in that it treats you like you're stupid it's not even an enjoyably bad movie it's just a bad movie even half the Simpsons cast couldn't save this movie. Let's talk about that marketing campaign a little yeah, bit, because yeah. that was very distinct at the time. I was very excited for this movie, and I thought they did a good job of building that excitement by not letting you know what Godzilla looked like, by keeping that mystique there, which is something that I will say, again, it's not something we get in modern movies so much. They, they seem to kind of forget about that. But Roland Emmerich did a really good job with that. I can't believe I'm saying this, but he did a good job with building that anticipation in Independence Day. There's a lot of buildup before the aliens really do anything and before you see anything relating to them and before the first attacks. And this movie tries to do that with Godzilla with you not seeing what he really looks like for a, a lot of the early part of the movie. But you have to have something to come after that. That anticipation has to lead up to something, and in this movie, it just doesn't. And even then, everything around that, everything not directly dealing with the monster, all the characters, the way every single scene plays out is so simplistic and just outright stupid. But that tagline, size does matter. Do you really want a bad sex joke to be the thing that people are associating with your movie before they've even seen it, and one that doesn't have anything to do with something like that? All of the text for the marketing was electric illuminated green. Yes, which I always thought was unusual, because you don't get a Godzilla shooting what you would think that would be would be his radiation beam, or at least something to do with radiation, but you don't get that in the movie. It doesn't fit. The marketing campaign was intense for this movie. They had signs on buses that said his foot is as long as this bus. They had Taco Bell commercials every five seconds, back when the Chihuahua was the Taco Bell mascot. I think I need a bigger book. They had toys, so many toys. Since the movie didn't perform as well as they expected, they ended up having a lot of toys left over. Because instead of selling the toys in anticipation of the movie, they didn't release the toys until the movie came out, and nobody wanted them. I'll briefly bring up the animated series that followed the movie, because a lot of people do like the animated series, mm -hmm. even if they don't like the movie. The series is okay. It's definitely way better than the movie. I wouldn't say it's great. It's from that weird studio that did Men in Black yep. and uh, Jumanji yep. and stuff like that, so everybody looks weird. Really weird. Yeah, 
the guy who plays Nick in the cartoon cannot act. He is a terrible voice actor. He is the worst voice actor that I've ever encountered in a starring role. For some reason, they brought back the sneezing scientist guy, and they carried on the joke of him sneezing all the time. It wasn't funny in the movie, but they thought it was funny enough to keep doing in the show. The show did at least have a bunch of other monsters for Godzilla to fight. Godzilla does shoot a radiation beam. Uh, it is the baby Godzilla that hatches at the end of the movie. It imprints itself on him. People involved with the cartoon were fans of the original movies and tried to bring classic monsters into it, but it takes Toho so long to approve things that they were never, never able to get any of them. It's not as good as some people say it is. I think they're just surprised that it's as good as it is compared to how bad the movie is. But at least if you go from the movie to that, you're going up in quality. And I do like the opening of the cartoon. It's pretty cool. I like the theme and it's an exciting opening. So Godzilla 98, no redeeming qualities as far as I'm concerned. Bad, annoying characters, very generic plot, very disappointing monster design, uninteresting action sequences, really bad humor throughout, cringe-inducing dialogue and character interactions. Just a bad movie in every possible way. It's not one of those movies where it's so bad that it's entertaining. It's not entertaining. It's boring. It's way too long. It's not worth it. Worst $3 I ever spent. I had to go out and find this stupid movie. Now I'm going to take the DVD. The next spam, snail mail I get. And they give me a prepaid envelope. I'm going to put this movie inside and send it back. <laughs> so when they tell me the warranty on your car is going to run out, they're going to get Godzilla. It's big. It's loud. It sucks. If you have made it to the end of this video, you either died at your desk or you went out to get some KFC and it's somehow auto-played to this video. This is a PSA to always turn off autoplay because you never know what piece of craft's gonna come up next <laughs> so be sure to check out other youtube channels 